Hello once again, history nerds. It is another week and we are super excited to bring this slightly different episode to you guys. As we said last week, the plan was to do an episode starting with Theodosia Burr before jumping into Evangeline Hamilton. The problem is that Evangeline is a story and a half herself. Therefore, we promise Theodosia will come as, as an extra episode in the near future while we're going to dedicate an entire episode to this hell of a ride. As we started last week, let's jump into our interesting tidbit that will come into play with this story. There was a group in the Gilded Age who were known as Ward McAllister's 400. The 400 were the pinnacle of New York society. Their name comes from the fact that 400 guests are said to have fit comfortably in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. The Astor name may sound familiar, as they were the pinnacle of society, and their daughter-in-law, Madeline, was a survivor of the Titanic. Oh. Yep. Well, 400 is a lot of people to fit in a ballroom. They, like, how they, big was their house? The Astors had, like, almost, like, all of the money, it seems. Like, from uh-huh. what I've seen about them, they were, like, the head of New York society. Okay. Um, New York socialites, damn. Yeah, and so basically, yeah, they could fit apparently 400 guests comfortably in the ba- in the ballroom. And then I definitely will be talking a little bit about the Titanic at some point because I, my heart is with the friggin' ship. My mother literally the other night was like, hey, do you want to go on a deep dive and go see the ruins of the Titanic? And I'm like, um, yes. And then she was like, do you have... $250,000. And I'm like, no, I do not. So therefore, I guess I am not going on a trip down to the Titanic. Well, what a trip that would be. Holy, that's a yeah. thing you can do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, I mean, you're there's, like, there's people who have had like a wedding on the Titanic where they will go down in a submarine and then just like hover the submarine and then, and then they will officiate the wedding down on the friggin bow of the titanic basically like you're just like hovering above the ship like as close as you can be because it's like way too deep for like people to go like deep sea diving oh no there, oh, no, no right? yeah so like, you're in like a submarine deep? like you're in a submarine to do it yeah, yeah like that's what i mean you have to be in the submarine yeah. like you couldn't go down and like scoop oh yeah no 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 like, so like you're doing like your wedding is in the submarine gotcha. hovering above the titanic fascinating I don't know enough about submarines. Is that, like, cartoonish picture of submarines having windows so that you can see into, like, the deep sea? Is that, like, legit? Someone, yes. is, like, tell me on the Instagram or something. <laughs> it is. Like, there's different type okay. of, like, types of submarines now. But, yes, you mm-hmm. can, like, there's all these windows and stuff. Because that would be sick to have pictures of, like, the first kiss with the actual Titanic in the background. Like, that would be pretty, like, that would kind of be fly as hell. Like, yeah. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I agree. All right. I should be so rich for that, though. Talk about expensive weddings. <laughs> well, this family probably could have afforded it. Oh, All right. <laughs> so, Kat. Yes. What do you know about Evangeline Hamilton? Next to nothing because I refuse to look anything up because you were so excited to tell me everything. I am so excited. I did not know that she existed before you mentioned her for the first time. <laughs> I didn't know until like a month ago. And then okay. I found out a little bit and I'm like I'm freaking doing a deep dive. All right, I'm about to take you down literally a crazy rabbit hole with this story. Oh boy. So it came to my attention when I got this beautiful book as an advanced copy called The Scandalous Hamiltons by Bill Schaefer. The book okay. came out July 26th. Um so this if this episode intrigues you then I definitely will recommend grabbing a copy to read as I won't be able to share every single juicy detail in this short amount of time with everybody. I okay. am going to start us off with as much of the beginning as I can. The problem is that the beginning for our context is literally the middle of the story for Evangeline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a tiny bit of detail that needs to be remembered and then jump into the middle of the story before we backtrack to the beginning for more context slash juicy details and then before we know it we'll find ourselves at an ending sound good so our timeline is going to skip around a little bit so listeners beware if you need a notepad and a pencil to keep this straight go get it now yeah all right let's jump in our story (laughs) takes place in 1889 new york city it's a world where 1,492 daily newspapers were published in the United States, along with an additional 
14,787 monthly, weekly, and semi-weekly papers. The largest, That's a lot. Yeah. The largest of the dailies in New York City reached almost one newspaper per three citizens in the city. Holy. I'm, I'm like, I know we talk about having information overload now because we have access to all of it all of the time, but like... That's kind of the beginnings of that, it feels like. Yeah. Telegraph Networks and the Associated Press allowed these stories to reach across, like, all of the city, so no one had to miss out on the major gossip. The story that I'm about to tell ended up playing out not only on the front page, like most stories, but on the subsequent interior pages as well. Interesting. Okay. So, something to remember is that the Hamilton name, by this point, is like how the Kennedy name is to us. The moment okay. that we see the Kennedy name in the news, we perk up, as the name is forever ingrained in our society after JFK's assassination in 1963. It right. was the same for those in the Gilded Age, after Alexander Hamilton was shot in 1804. Pretty that makes much, sense. Yeah, pretty much all subsequent family members were listed in the social register, since then, while also being super well-known in political and financial circles. Most okay. were also members of the 400 that I mentioned earlier. Right. See, I told okay. you to be part of the story. By 1889, the line of the Hamilton family that spurs from Alexander's fourth son, fifth child, um, John Church Hamilton, yes, he was named after Angelica's husband, Aww. had been well-established. John Church Hamilton was a member of the army during the War of 1812 before he became a historian. He collected all of his father's letters and papers. His first novel was The Life of Alexander Hamilton. However, almost all the copies were destroyed in a fire while they were being bound. He did go oh. on to write a couple, like, like seven volumes in, like, a history of Alexander Hamilton after this one. John right, Church okay. Hamilton's fifth son was Schuyler Hamilton. Most of his life was spent in service to the army, including the Mexican War and the Civil War. Between times, he enjoyed farming and being an engineer. Okay. Schuyler's eldest son was Robert Ray Hamilton. Robert Ray was a member of the New York State Assembly for five years before becoming a rancher slash hunter. The heroine, okay. though, of our story is one Evangeline Hamilton, and we're going to start her part of the story on a Monday. The Monday of January 7th, 1889 to be exact. Eva had been in a relationship with a man for four years. During this relationship, they had maintained separate lives and spent as much time apart as they had spent together. Her man really only saw her on weekends as he spent most of his weekdays in Albany for work. Three weeks prior to this day, Eva had given birth to their first child, and so they were on the Pavonia Ferry from Manhattan to Patterson, New Jersey to be married. Their pastor, Reverend Edison Burr, no relation though to, to Aaron Burr, had oh. never met either of them until they knocked on his door as they had decided to marry at the Market Street Church. It was just out of the way enough that no one knew them personally, and their story wouldn't be given any undue attention. So they had the kid and then got married. Yes. Ooh, especially at that time. That's a yikes. Yeah. The man that Eva married was the one and only Robert Ray Hamilton. As he went by Ray, I will be calling him by that name for the rest of this story. Okay. Now, Eva wasn't born a Hamilton. The last name that Ray knew her by was Steele. She came from a poor family in Northeast Pennsylvania and had to scratch her way to a better life in New York. In this sense, okay. she resembles her new great-grandfather in Alexander Hamilton, right? Ray was 38 years old, while Eva registered as being age 29. In the Gilded okay. Age, the average age for newlywed couples was 26 for men and 22 for women. Both of them right. stated to the Reverend that they had never been married before. Okay. So because um, they came, just the two of them, and they hadn't met anybody when they got to this um, location for their wedding, the reverend's wife and mother-in-law witnessed the wedding for the couple. Oh, that's kind of sweet of them to stand in right? and do that for two strangers. Yeah. After the wedding, Eva and Ray took off for San Diego. 
Their daughter, Beatrice, was left with the family that lived in the boarding house that she would be living in for the wedding, um, but then brought to California with a wet nurse named Mary Ann Donnelly. Okay. Uh, so at this time, wet nurses were very common. Um, Ray would be living in his own home when they returned, of which he had 32 homes and 31 vacant lots under his name. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, the honeymoon took place in San Diego so that Ray could look at development properties along the Southern California coast. How at romantic. Least, at least that is the story that was given to cover up the marriage and the baby. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. You see, the Hamilton family and friends had zero inkling that there was a relationship happening between Ray and Eva from the get-go. Really? Eva okay. speculated that by spending a long time on the Californian coast, their marriage and child would then be plausible as happening during the trip. Gotcha. Okay. So then it's not like a shock. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Eva wasn't a stranger to coming up with plausible stories. She had spent most of her life changing her name and her own background, depending on the audience. Interesting. This is giving me, like, con artist vibes already, and I'm very curious if it's going to, like, continue going in that direction. So during the 1800s, this was super easy to do, as there were no forms of identification to produce. Who you said you were was who you were to the people that you met. Yeah, right. Um, some acquaintances thought of Eva as an orphan who was adopted by the Steels. Others oh. thought that her birth parents were wealthy and she was an actress or performer. She okay. had no stage credits to support that claim, but it didn't stop her from continuing it. They just believed her. Yeah. <laughs> Coming okay. to California, I mean, though, didn't need a story. She clearly only... she could act because she was convincing everyone around her that right? she was, like, five different people, so... Yeah. She only had to be a mother and a wife with her new name. However, after four months in California, Eva became unwell. She lost 40 pounds and started to drink heavily. The couple immediately packed up and went back to the East Coast, where Ray notified his family of his new bride and daughter. Let's jump to August of 1889, shall we? Okay. Ray and Eva decided to rent two bedrooms at an inn when they arrived from California. The innkeeper, Elizabeth Rupp, watched for six weeks while Ray and Eva argued severely. Eva and Marianne drank excessively, and two strange visitors would come to see Eva while Ray was on overnight trips for work. Okay. What shady shit is she into? (laughs) At 3 a.m. on the morning of their departure from the inn, Ray and Eva started a major fight just moments after waking. The night before, Ray had asked Eva for a formal separation from the marriage and had offered her $5,000 per year as well as whatever Beatrice would need provided for her. If Eva refused the offer, he would return to New York without her and leave her with nothing. I mean, honestly, kind of a good author, offer, especially at the time. Like, 5000 was, like, a lot, a lot. So, like, uh, fair. But, like, what the fuck? Did he catch her in something? Like, where is this coming from? I think it's, I think at this point it was coming from, like, a lot of, like, their fights and stuff. And okay. her drinking habits. Um, right. Kind of a thing. Eva's response, though? Yeah. She countered that if he went through with what he had proposed, then she would confirm the whispers that had been going through his inner circle for a long time. But what actually happened with their marriage and stuff, and that it did not happen the way that they said it would happen? That Robert Ray Hamilton had married a prostitute that he had knocked up. What? I mean, I believe her. I believe that she could do it. Like, Yeah. Well, hey. (laughs) Help me. I can't help you. Fluff wants your strings. Fluff wants your strings. Stop chewing on my hoodie string. We're in the middle of something important. Hey, good. Go play over there. (laughs) I know. You want attention, but your claws are so sharp right now. Can you go play with it? Here, here, here. Fidget cube. See? Go get it. Why are you like this? Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, Eva had known what she could get out of men with her charms by the time Uh she was 17 years old. Oh, that's too young. Honey. A salesman had passed through the town where she had been living with her parents. He offered for her to travel with him, as he had been enchanted with her. Four days into traveling with him, he raped her and then abandoned her. 
honey. She traveled a hundred miles south to Waverly, New York, where she was taken into a brothel by a Mrs. Washburn to begin her career in the sex trade. Mm. One client at a brothel that she worked at started to demand sexual favors in return for not sending her to jail. What? But they're also in the brothel. Aren't they also just, like, just as complicit? Like Yeah. He learned the hard way that the beautiful girl had a demon's temper. Oh, dear Lord, what did she do to him? On his next visit, she aimed a gun between his eyes and pulled <gasps> the trigger. The bullet missed the direct shot, but still blew off his right ear. She ran Ooh. back to where her parents were living, now wanted for attempted murder. Holy shit, that escalated quickly. Damn. Like, yeah. I mean, dude was a piece of shit, like, clearly. But, like, oh, she jumped to murder real damn quick. Mm-hmm. This Holy started girl a... has been through it. Oh, yeah. So this started a stream of men where she would find out what they might want and convince them to marry her. The first man that she did this with got whisked away by his family before they could go through with the marriage. She moved back to New York and joined the 40,000 other girls in the prostitution industry at the time. That's so many. That is a shit ton of women that had to go into prostitution in order to be able to, like, make a living, basically. That's, like, okay, so, like, the history of prostitution is a very interesting thing to dive into, or, like, sex work is a very interesting thing to dive into. There, There are times in history where, like... This is all just off the top of my head. I have no sources for this. But I know that there's times in history where, like, your options rather essentially, like, be a wife or be a sex worker. Yeah. Um, and so, like, the girls that chose it, you know, that's what you chose. Like, that's your life choices. But, like, the girls who are pushed into it are the ones that I feel for. And it's, like, too hard to make that distinction between, like, one and the other, like, from a distance, right? So it's, like, just hearing that number, like how many of those girls were just being exploited, especially at that time when women had so few protections, like, yeah. Ah, ah. So Eva worked her way um, from like the more slum brothels into the refined brothels uptown and waited for the right man to come along who would support her in a life of luxury. She okay. found him. When Robert Ray Hamilton walked into the 21st street body house in 1885. Now let's head back over to the story that is taking place in 1889. So this all really was a con. On the morning of the departure, Eva asked her wet nurse to run out for a bottle of whiskey. The fights, threats, and alcohol was nothing new to Marianne. So she went to the nearby hotel where Eva's friends from the New York boarding house were staying. Anna Swinton and Joshua Mann came down when Eva had contacted them about getting her clothing taken in due to her weight loss when she was in California. Marianne went to their room, cracked open the bottle of whiskey, poured out glasses, and then poured out the gossip about Ray and Eva's marriage, including the threats made the night before. Uh huh. So at the same time as Marianne was pouring out the whiskey and the gossip, Elizabeth Rupp was going up to the room of Eva and Ray's to beg for them to be quiet. Okay. When she walked in, the couple were in a moment of peace, with Eva sitting on Ray's knee, smiling and laughing quietly to each other. Interesting switch. Marianne returned around 9 a.m., alcohol on her breath, and a two-thirds full bottle of whiskey. Okay. Eva immediately fired her, causing Marianne to scream out, you she-devil, before spilling that Eva and Joshua were likely more than friends. Well, now she's extra fired. (laughs) Yeah. Ray Uh, found himself playing referee between the drunk Marianne and the fiery-tempered Eva. Oh, that would have (laughs) sucked. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of chaos for one night. Morning. This is just a morning. This is from between morning. three a. This is between three a.m. and nine a.m. in the morning. This is too early in the morning for this bullshit. Like, have any of them sat down to have their coffee yet? Like, just like chill out for a minute, eat your breakfast on the balcony, watch the sunrise, chill. <laughs> yeah, not with these. Not with this little family. Oh my word! Seriously, holy. At one point, Eva threw 
the metal bathtub for her daughter directly at Marianne's head. Girl is a little too okay with murder, I'm not gonna lie. Luckily, she doesn't have good aim as we already learned. Okay, so this is a pattern. So instead of a hole through Marianne's head, there was a hole in the wall of the inn. Oh no! The entire okay. time, little Beatrice is asleep in the in the wet nurse's room. Somehow this kid could sleep through all of this shit. Okay, I mean, when you get used to falling asleep while your parents are fighting, like, you can sleep through anything, so that doesn't super surprise me until the metal bathtub goes through a wall. How did that not wake her up? Like, was she drugged? Is she okay? I don't know. Um, once okay. Ray convinced Marianne to go to the adjoining room, Eva continued to drink. Pissed that her husband didn't take her side fully during the argument. The husband who literally just was telling her that he wanted a divorce, that that husband, she's surprised. That, that husband. Okay, well, because Ray, of course, decided to then bring the conversation back round to the separation. Uh-huh, that's going to calm things right down. He has no, like, self-interest here. It's just like... Let me just bring, like, I don't, like, yeah, you just threw a freaking metal bathtub at our wet nurse's head, trying to basically kill her. So I'm just going to bring that conversation back around to the thing I was threatening you with that caused most of this the whole debacle in the first place. Survival instincts never heard of her, honestly. Couldn't name her if I saw her. Like, <sighs> yeah. Dude. <laughs> By noon, something happened mm -hmm. that caused our next scene in this story. This is all in one day. <laughs> this is all in one morning, <laughs> not even just this a whole day. This is all in one morning, we're at noon. Guests okay. of the inn were just getting themselves settled for lunch. When there were suddenly mm -hmm. heavy footsteps, crashing furniture, and a deep, loud thud coming from over their heads. Oh no! One of the waiters went running directly to the suite of Ray and Eva, knowing yeah, full well been... where it was coming from after these past six weeks. <laughs> well, yeah, they've been fighting this entire time. There's no way they don't know that, like, the noise complaint is that room, like. Yeah. Oh, where Lord. he found Eva standing by the bed with a double-edged Mexican dagger in her hand. Okay. Ray was restraining her while he was partially wrapped in a bed sheet that covered his torn clothing. Mary Ann lay crumpled on the floor, clutching her bloody stomach. Okay, I don't think Mary Ann deserved this. I don't, well, I don't really think that he deserved this. He seems kind of a victim in this con, too, I'm not gonna lie. But, like... Mary Ann had spent the last two hours in her room, furious for being dismissed by Eva, before mm -hmm. she re-entered the room that was shared by the couple. Mm -hmm. Rather than trying to discuss the situation in a calm manner, she grabbed Eva by the shoulders and pushed her backwards, intent on throttling the other woman. You've got to be kidding me. This woman threw a metal bathtub at you. You're going to try to, like, like I, uh, just leave, just leave, just leave. Just well, I mean, she was drunk. Leave. Like, she was drunk. And she has been spending a pile well, of time with Eva and Ray. <laughs> well, and she's been spending a pile of time with Eva and Ray. Like, basically, since January, she's been with them. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. Like, all of this violence that you're constantly surrounded in, it would build up, like, in you as well. Like, the anger that you're in this situation. So, like, I guess... Yeah. I guess it makes sense. <sighs> so, once Eva broke free... Um, from, like, apparently the two of them, like, danced, basically, um, for a while. But once Eva broke free from the, um, wet nurse's grasp, she grabbed Ray's knife from his partially packed trunk and started slashing at both Ray and Marianne. She missed the wet nurse's intestines by an eighth of an inch. Oh, that's so close. She's had so many near misses, like... Yeah. How many attempted murders do you have to have before it just becomes a murder charge, to be honest? When the police arrived, <laughs> the officer who went upstairs asked Eva if she had stabbed the woman who was downstairs on a cot being attended to. Eva responded coolly, I sent for you. I want that woman arrested. Her name is Marianne Donnelly, and I will appear against her at the police station. The, the woman is on the floor bleeding out. Like, what? Ew. 
The officer repeated the question, and Eva replied, I did it, and I'm sorry I didn't finish her. Oh my word. This, uh, so I, listen, listen, clearly girl has been through some stuff, right? Yeah. Like, but like, is this how, is, is this, is this how we, is this how we're choosing to respond? Like, I, I, I don't think murder should be your first instinct when it comes to people doing things you don't like, personally. Maybe that's just me. No, I mean, but, it like, definitely shouldn't be your first instinct unless it's like self-defense. Which it kind and, of was, but it kind of wasn't. But like, okay, here's my thing about self-defense, though. Your goal should not be to murder. If you're genuinely just defending yourself, your goal should be to get away. Yeah, and she right? did get away and then grabbed the fucking knife to stab the woman. This is what I mean. At that point, it becomes excessive. If they can't follow you, it, anything you do beyond that is excessive. Fluff, why are you attacking me? Fluff chose violence. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought, you little scary cat. <laughs> yeah, you got caught, didn't you? Uh, well, plus, yeah. <laughs> Emma had her husband there who could have, like, he was sober, basically, at this point still, even though the two women weren't. Like, there was a third person there that would have been able to, like, like, she was still, like, slashing at yeah. both of them. Yeah. I mean, his de-escalation skills are shit as well, don't get me wrong. Well, but yeah, like... he, he escalated things more than de-escalated yeah. things. So, yeah. Both Eva and Ray got arrested. Mm -hmm. Eva was held without bail, while Ray was released on a $600 bond. Which to him is pennies. Yeah. So, okay. The next day, they both appeared in court. Ray treated her like a stranger while they were seated together. And he immediately threw Eva under the bus and was well, released yeah. of all charges. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. Dude already wanted to be rid of her. This is a very convenient way to make that happen. Yeah. Ray stayed at the city hall to watch his, in order to watch his wife be put on the train for the short ride to the county jail um, until, the, until, like, a grand jury could be brought together for, like, the full charges to be brought against her. Right. The press had flocked to city hall and were furiously scribbling down notes about everything they could see. Uh-huh. Ray's intentions were to watch her leave and then take off to live his life without her. However, Eva threw her arms around him in front of the press and sobbed her goodbyes. Ray saw the press soaking this in, so he rushed to buy a ticket so he could sit next to her for the 20-minute ride, all so that the newspapers wouldn't deem him as cold-hearted the next morning. Oh my word, she knew what she was doing with that. She Holy so she knew. I bet you that, like, while he was, like, waiting with her, like, he probably, like, said, like, I'm basically waiting with you and then I'm taking off. And she was like, oh, hell no, you aren't. <laughs> nah, -uh, honey. <laughs> while I'm in jail, worried. Eva's mood changed rapidly. Mm. Rather than being distressed as she was the day before, she became full of rage. Um, well, I mean, yeah, that kind of seems to be, like, yeah. Yeah. Her friend... Not, like, her default, but, like... Yeah. She seems to get there pretty quickly. Like, super quickly. Her friend, Anna Swinton, visited to bring her food and a telegram. The food mm -hmm. ended up being thrown against the walls of the cell and trampled on the floor. Scraps of the now ripped-up telegram mixed in. I want to know what that said. I would love to know what that telegram said, and if she even read it. Yeah. Like, yeah. people, like, sources couldn't quite tell if she had read it or not, or if right. she just immediately ripped it up and said, fuck it to everything. I, w I wonder if, the te like, if something in the telegram triggered the rage, or if it was, like, she was angry. She was already, apparently, like, angry and, like, being pissy with, like, the guards, like, the jailers and stuff. So, right. I think she was already just pissed that she was in jail Fair. to begin with, right? As Anna left, the press swarmed her for information on how she knew Eva. Uh -huh. Anna gave them a third last name that she knew Eva by, Brill. She also told them how her son, Joshua, was Eva's first and most devoted lover, and that even though Eva married Ray, Josh was the one who had her warmest feelings. Oh boy! Oh no! Oh 
dear. Back at home, Ray was receiving, like, telegrams from family and friends, all asking, like, what can we do to help what you, basically. Yeah. He also received a telegram from an unknown sender. It read, you can obtain very important information concerning the child you testified that Mrs. Hamilton is the mother of by presenting in person this message at Western Union Telegraph Office. Hey. Ray wasn't the only one finding out about the real identity of the baby that Eva claimed to be theirs. One of the detectives investigating the stabbing also started to uncover the truth while questioning Anna Swinton and Joshua Mann. Okay, so who was the baby daddy then? Because I'm getting a feeling it wasn't Ray. Ray Hamilton had gone to the home that Eva was sharing with Josh and Anna to meet the baby that Eva claimed to be his. It is said that he had kissed the baby on the head, but showed no emotion at the realization that he was a father. The day after, the baby girl became sick, and within 48 hours, she passed away. It was found that the little girl had died of starvation, as Eva didn't hire a wet nurse and couldn't lactate herself, so she just neglected the child. The name of the child that the doctor was given for the death certificate was unusual, however. It was Alice Mann, the daughter of George and Alice Mann. Oh! Who are not real people. Oh! So, so, who, so what, so why, so why did, why? (laughs) Eva didn't want to give up the scheme, however, so she contacted the midwife who ran the baby farm. These were places where babies who were born from unwanted pregnancies would be abandoned to midwives with no questions asked. The babies who survived would then be sold to anyone who had five to ten dollars cash to spare. Five to ten dollars for a human child? Yes. I'm gonna lose my mind. That's the most inhumane thing. Like, it was actually, like, quite common. Um, so, like, unbonded pregnancies and different stuff, right? Like, because, um, they couldn't always be, uh, aborted or Mm -hmm. that, um, like, orphanages and stuff wouldn't take them because they weren't considered, like, holy, well, holy babies, I guess, right? Like, that, like, the way that the babies were conceived Uh, and stuff like that wasn't holy and the fact that the mothers didn't want them wasn't holy because, like, you're still very religious at this point, right? Right, and a lot right. of the orphanages are run by the church. Right. So there are midwives who would then basically sell babies that were the unwanted babies because there's nowhere like to keep them oh, and stuff. That's so heartbreaking. Those poor kids. Yeah. So sadly, the first daughter was a baby farm purchase, and before she was even buried, Eva had bought another to replace her. This baby also got sick before Ray could see the baby again and passed. So, okay, so, hang on, so, so, this is Eva claiming that these are Ray's kids, though, right? Yes. And then he's, like, not emotionally attached to them, like, whatsoever. Yeah, so he had only met, like, the first baby, like, so the first baby, he had only met her for, like, a few bit, like, a few moments, and then he didn't, and then he didn't ever meet the second baby, or know that the first baby even had passed away. Oh my god, okay. So, like, did he not notice that she was never pregnant, or, like... Um, well, I mean, like, considering that they, like, so, like, he only saw her on weekends every so often when he came back from Albany. Well, so sure, he never but, really like, saw, would there like, be, like, a nine-month gap in there? Like, I don't I, know. I, I have no idea. Like, it depends as to when they saw each other, like, kind of a thing, right? Like, yeah. maybe, like, so, like, she would be saying, like, I think like, there's a certain time frame, especially with your first child, that mm-hmm. you aren't showing and then that you are showing, so it could be that right. within the time that she would have been showing, showing, um, right. that maybe they just never saw each other. That's, like, I, I'm, I'm just blown away by the how. Like, literally, how do you pull mm. that off? It gets worse, honey. Oh, so this Lord. poor okay. girl was buried under the name Ethel Parsons, the last name of that man who was spirited away from Eva before they could marry earlier in her life. Mm, oh, the no. doctor who had seen baby number two was told to do what he could to save the baby, as Eva would have given him a hundred thousand dollars if she lived. That is how invested she was in the scheme to marry Ray. And baby number two. 
Correct. But baby number one. Well, but think baby number one, she like she like oh she couldn't do anything about it, right? But then baby number right. two, it was like apparently the doctor was set, like told like to do what he could to save the baby. Okay. Kind of a thing, right? Interesting. So that one wasn't from neglect. That one was just like they were sick. Uh, no, I think it was the same thing. That so, okay, so because she won't feed the Emma, kid, but she'll Emma pay the doctor a hundred thousand dollars to yeah. fix it. Like yeah. Why? Well, because they, is... like because Eva was never pregnant, she wouldn't be lactating, and she Could she still hadn't nurse? hired like... a wet nurse yet. Bro, like, please. <laughs> Baby number three was then purchased by Anna Swinton, but Eva rejected the child because she was dark haired rather than blonde. Which wouldn't have fit her narrative. Well, yeah, and so she literally said to the woman like that Ray Hamilton was smart enough to realize. <laughs> That baby number one was blonde, and baby number three, and then, and then this baby was, was dark haired, kind of a thing, yeah. right? So she took like, him. Ma- no- he may not notice much, but he know he would notice that. Yeah. So Anna Swinton refused. So mm-hmm. Eva took apparently took matters into her own hands and went to find baby number four, who did survive and become Beatrice Ray Hamilton. Baby number three was returned to the midwives under the guise that the lady who had purchased her died, and so there was no use for the child. I mean, that's one way to go about it, I guess. So, Beatrice was baby number four that, of I, the like, schemes. Uh, oh my word. So like, they spent, like, $40 in, 18, in like, the eight, like, later 1800s to purchase hmm. babies for a scheme. And killed half of those babies. What the fuck? Why would you not just hire a wet nurse right away or, like, use literally any kind of milk is better than nothing? Like, I... What? Well, especially, like, if you have... If Anna's part of this, Anna has children. She should have known better to uh, even, like, help Eva figure this out (laughs) as to how not to kill a child. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to not kill a baby. Like, I, like, I, like, how, like, yeah. <laughs> like, how? How do you kill two babies doing the same thing? Like, I just, I don't, like, you're willing to pay $100,000 to fix the baby that you broke, but you're not willing to just, like, feed them. Like, I, how did she get away with any of this? Like, I, I just, uh. So the story of the four purchased babies was confirmed just days later when the police found the German midwife who had sold the children to Eva and Anna. What the fuck? Okay, I have questions about this midwife too, by the way. Right? Like, she sold, like, four children to the same person and didn't question it. Well, so I think, I mean, she sold, I don't know who bought the first two, like, who actually went to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. but then Anna went and bought the third one and fucked it up by getting the raw, like, a raw, the wrong looking baby. Yeah. And apparently, like, when Eva found Beatrice, literally, apparently, what she said was, well, if it wasn't for these bigger ears, she'd be perfect, but she'll do. So there's no motherly love at all coming out of this one. But I don't think... This is purely a con. But, I mean, Like, like, I don't think that the midwives fully cared as long as they got the babies out and made some money off of it like these aren't like the midwives that are like the up and up midwives of the 1800s I mean, obviously I mean, obviously but you'd think they'd have some kind of human instinct of like i care if this baby dies after i send them off or not but like you'd think humans, why 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 just why <laughs> why yeah. are humans like this <laughs> So, Beatrice was left with Elizabeth Rupp when her parents got, well, her alleged parents got arrested. So, this is the lady who ran the inn that the stabbing took place in. So, I think, basically, it was like, when they got arrested, they just left the kid with the innkeeper. Rupp was... I mean, (laughs) probably safer there than with her parents, so... Yeah. Rupp was sent financial assistance for the young child from Ray, who continued to send letters asking about the little girl's health. Aww. At the same okay, time, so he did come to care about her a little bit. Yeah. At the same time, Ray sued for his marriage to Eva to be annulled, and to keep her from claiming any of his estate. Fair. Sadly, Ray was found drowned in the river that his ranch sat by by the next summer. <gasps> it is suspected. Was 
It okay. is suspected that his roommate at the ranch had murdered him, as the roommate had been suspected to have done to his wife a few years back. This dude, okay, he... He's a little too trusting. My like, guy. Listen, listen, I'm, 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 I'm not about to go around blaming murder victims, right? But... Yeah. This dude seriously was a magnet for trouble. Yeah. Like... Was he okay? So did he know that she was a sex worker? Like when they met and when they are like, like, yeah, okay, so that they was met legit. at the okay. brothel. Like they met in the brothel, so he knew that she was a sex worker. Um, okay, and then basically in order to get him to marry her, she just she fake that so. hey, you have a child. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Three months after Ray passed, Eva was voted uh-huh. free by the New Jersey Board of Pardons. The con woman... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How long? Three months after Ray passed away. So she that basically sat cold. in jail for like a year, if not less. For attempted murder. Yeah. And for you know, buying babies. Like the detective... That's not it... long enough. Uh, okay. Um. So yeah, the con woman went on to literally star in a play of her story entitled The Hammertons. So part of her story did come true that she was an actress and that she had now has a role to have on her acting resume. Listen, <laughs> maybe this is just me, but I personally think that if you're gonna go around conning people and murdering people because you feel like it, maybe, you shouldn't get to profit off of your own story for conning people and murdering people. I maybe. Well, she technically, <laughs> from what I saw, I don't think that the midwife, like not the midwife, like the wet nurse. I don't think that she actually fully ended up like passing away from her. But she tried and, though. That was the intent. But she had like at least three attempted murders. Listen. If you have an interesting life and it just happens to be an interesting life and you write a story about it, you write a play about it, you star in it, good for you. Good for taking your the hard situations that you went through and, like, finding a way to, like, succeed regardless and despite of them, right? But, like, but if you cause the bad situations for everyone around you, maybe don't. <laughs> I just, uh... And everyone, we were like, okay, so hang on. So she is, she is, she is, she is, she's the lead in this play, right? So, so did she like write it? Did she work with other people to write it? They heard all this stuff that they did and they were like, yeah, we want to work with you. You know, the con artist who's trying to kill people. We want to work with you. That seems safe. Let's do that. They just went along with it. I couldn't tell like if she had written it or not, or if she just ended up starring in it. But I'm like, how could... Like, this is just the title. I'm like, it sounds like one of those, like, Harry Potter spoof musical thing. Like, it sounds like, like one of those, like, because it's a break, because it was entitled it, like, The Hammertons. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it sounds like a very Potter musical or something. Like, we're just spoofing it. <laughs> it kind of does. It, it sounds like a Hamilton ripoff. Yeah. But it's oh, one that word. I kind of wish I could see, just because I'm like, Alexander this... Hammerton. <laughs> Just because, like, this story is just so fucking crazy. I want to see the script. I really <laughs> want to see. <laughs> like, I wish that oh. there was a way that we could have, that like, we could actually, like, see, like, her starring in it as well. Because I'm like, I want to see, like, does she actually have, like, good acting chops? Or is she, like, an Amber Heard of the 1800s? <laughs> oh, my word. I mean, she convinced a lot of people that she was somebody that she wasn't. So she's got some kind of acting skills in there somewhere. She's just, she's a method actor, okay? Like, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so. I have so many questions. So, little just Beatrice. Specifically about the play thing. Right. I, yeah. So, little Beatrice had been left a yearly inheritance of $1,200 in Ray's will. But. Hi. The Hamilton family sued to have her inheritance shrunken to basically zero, and she just disappeared from the public eye. Which, for this poor kid, good on her for disappearing from the public yeah. eye, but mm-hmm. fucking Christ, Hamilton family, like, like this kid, kid didn't do anything! She was a baby! And got dragged yeah. into this shit. Yeah, that's, like, 
that's not super duper fair to the kid. I hope it was at the point where the the kid was old enough to be like an adult and like no no no. Oh, it was like no. it was like within like a year or two. Like they did it like super early on because the Hamilton family wanted to try to erase as much as they could. Oh come on, it's child. But it's a Man, big a prominent rich family. And this is a whole big scar on their public image. It's a baby! Wouldn't being charitable to the baby that had no fault in this be a much better image than just cutting them off and pretending it never happened? Like, apparently not to the Hamiltons. Ugh, <laughs> uh, that's awful. All right. So, only one person in the world at the time sought out Eva's story past her testimony in court. Aw. And that person is somebody that I will be speaking about four episodes from now, my journalistic hero, Nellie Bly. No way, they're connected? They are connected. Oh my goodness. Okay. I didn't realize this until I started actually researching it. Uh, and then I was just like, wait, what? Hello? <laughs> I'm so, sorry, who? <laughs> and what's funny is that I actually, I think I had actually read this article um, that Nellie Bly wrote. I think I actually mm. read it like years ago, but didn't make the connection when Hamilton came out that, hang on, wait, this is, like, the same friggin' family. Yeah. So Nellie interviewed Eva while she was in prison and got a mm -hmm. completely different story out of the woman. Oh. Eva told her that Beatrice really was her baby, that the other babies were all bought on Anna Swinton's insistence. She accused the older woman and her son of blackmailing her into ensuring that part of Ray's money would go towards supporting them. She also accused Ray of giving her $300 to consult a doctor for the first two pregnancies that she had while she was seeing him before the marriage. She is a con woman. She so is a con woman. just take her at her word. Yeah. But I mean, like, Nellie Bly seemed to, like, kind of like take her with like a great like with a grain of salt but also be like hey like okay is this it's your story or like is this your real story or did the hamiltons make you out to be a villain and like right. that the and, like so like if the swintons were actually um blackmailing her and stuff like right so like did like was there like a thing that the swintons were trying to make like put it all on her and then the hamiltons also tried to put it all on her like, was she just a woman that was in bad circumstances or not? Right. So it's possible that this is the other side of the coin. This is the other side of the story. Yeah. But also she's a con woman. And so it's just as likely that she's just lying to make herself look better than she is, too. So, like... Yeah. Like, there's... Like, so you have to take, like, everything on this... Of the story with a grain of salt as to... Okay. Like, what was it, right? So um, often the truth is somewhere in the middle. I, yeah. like, and in this case, I guess the middle would be that, like, maybe they didn't, like, blackmail her, but, like, all parties were, like, definitely on board, and it definitely wasn't just her fault. Yeah. Like, this does not seem like the kind of situation where nobody's, like, it doesn't seem like the kind of situation where there's anybody who's, like, totally not to blame. Yeah. Where everyone carries a little bit of it. It It, it just seems like a clash of people that, like, should not have been in the same space together and uh she desperately needed therapy oh definitely i mean like she like if her story if her story like with how she got into like the sex work and stuff is true mm -hmm. it's a horrible story but then like if her story about her temper is true and that she immediately went to violence like what i've seen of like her story from before didn't really give her like there wasn't like that she had violence in the home and stuff like that that she was in like kind of like continual violence which is something that i'm like okay that would definitely impact somebody's thinking that violence is the right way to go right although if she went through like a big traumatic moment like that that changes your brain in ways yeah like in different ways for everybody right so it's also entirely possible that she wasn't violent before and then that like triggered broke something. something in her yeah. right exactly um, so Ever had even told Nellie Bly that she had been married to the first man from back home, this Parsons guy, and that they had mm -hmm. a daughter. Yeah. But when asked about the daughter, she refused to say much other than the 13-year-old the girl was in school um, and knew nothing about 
what had happened, like, with her stuff with, like, the, like being in prostitution and the mm-hmm. whole Hamilton scenario. Um, and even said that, like, please don't, like, I don't want this other guy part of this story. Like, he's married and off with another woman. Like, it's not his, mm-hmm. like, he doesn't need to be part of this. I'll leave him out of it. Like, leave him yeah. and leave the 13-year-old kid out of it. Right. Which I'm like, that is, Mm -hmm. to me, I'm like, okay, if this is true, like, yeah, totally, that seems plausible. That she'd be like, no, like, leave these people out of it. They have nothing to do with it. I want to protect them. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So I do want to know what everybody else thinks is truth. Um, I'm going to have links to the articles as well as to, like, the full article by Nellie Bly that outlines exactly what Eva told her. In a few weeks' time, I will be doing a deeper dive into this article um, as well as Nellie's other famous articles about, like, her time in the asylum and her trip around the world and a little bit more to, like, Nellie's story in general. But mm-hmm. now you all know a little bit about the sensational story of Evangeline and Robert Ray Hamilton and oh, hopefully it will encourage everybody to do some more research as it is a story that would take multiple episodes to fully uncover. Like, I literally kind of, like, skimmed the surface <laughs> Of everything. Oh my <laughs> To give you guys, like, to give everybody, like, all of you listeners and Kat, just, like, a <laughs> general overview of all of this shit. There's so much. There's so much. There's so friggin' much. Oh my goodness. The story like, is wild. The story was wild from start to finish. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah. My mind is completely blown that one person could live through all of this and, like, and so much of it happened in not a very long amount of time. Yeah. Like, like it literally, of like, most years. of this happened within, like, matter of, like, six months. That's insane. Like, like you weren't kidding when you said this was a roller coaster. Like, holy. Yeah. Like, my, like I'm just, I'm, I'm speechless at this point. Like, my mind is just completely blown. Like, ugh. I told you this is what's what going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I just, like, and this is not that many generations removed from, like, Alexander Hamilton. Like, no, this is his great grandson. This is like not like, like whole like uh, 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 just yeah. a family line going from like that to that is like yeah, it's what like eighty five years after Hamilton died that this all was going down with his that's, family. That's that's so wild. I can't even process it anymore. My brain is just like, no, nope, we're done. <laughs> this is this is one of those stories for sure where like going back in time and talking to the person would be like so extremely satisfying and just like not necessarily believing everything she says because obviously but like just like having a conversation and be like what is it like talking to you like do you come across as super manipulative or are you just very like casually lying about everything like I think even I for me personally I would just like to be a fly on the wall mm just kind of watch it all happen from a distance. Yeah, like just that be like that innocent little fly on the wall and just watch it all happen like a freaking TV series. Yeah, like I'm just the person in the background in the coffee shop. I'm just the person in the room in the next room over in the inn. Like, <laughs> yeah, like I would like to actually see it happen to know what actually freaking went happened. down, right? Yeah. Or if I could just, like, split myself between, like, multiple flies so that I could be, like, at the Swintons, <laughs> at the Mans, at... <laughs> like, seeing everything, Like, yeah. seeing everything to be able to know, like, what pieces are falling and where. Yeah. Oh, boy. Although we are kind of going into still, like, that fantastical realm of theater. Yeah. It does as, still somehow tie back. As next week, I think, I'm looking at movie set myths. Mm-hmm. Well, you're looking at cursed plays, especially the tales of Macbeth. <laughs> Where all the cursed play legends started, essentially. Well, yeah. all the fa- all the popular ones. So, the famous ones. We are uh, still because... kind of staying in like the sensational realm. <laughs> yeah. And stories sure. that may not be believable. Yeah. I mean, it is fun to talk about the sensational. And just like, especially things like this, where it's like, what's your theory on this? Because like... There's a lot of theories that could be plausible. There's a lot of things that could be true about this story. And it's just, it's we're just never going to know. Yeah. So, mm. now that I've blown your brain, wow. <laughs> we'll catch up again for next week. Mm-hmm. That's the story of Evangeline Hamilton. You're welcome. <laughs>